Well, hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us today uh, as we take on this uh, topic that's quite important and quite salient to, uh, and it's affecting science, and that's repairing your producibility. And as our uh, list of attendees is any uh, indication, I think it's a topic that's really important and salient to many of you. My name is Hamid Ganadan. I'm the CEO of a strategy firm, Linux. And this webinar is uh, being hosted by ATCC. Now, ATCC is a nonprofit organization, and at its core, it's a standard uh, organization. And they supply uh, cataloged and authenticated biological materials to the scientific community. And that's why it's so close to their mission to help uh, in uh, promoting and uh, repairing your reproducibility that we're having this webinar. So uh, one quick view, uh, one quick note as you're getting in and getting oriented. Um, there's a question box in your controller and I, I hope that during the discussion that you'll take an opportunity to use that question box to uh, put information into the, um, into the discussion. So I'll just give you a minute to get, get uh, oriented there. Great, and I see some uh, other people coming in. Great. So we've got a pretty rich discussion uh, planned for you this hour. And after meeting our uh, panelists, I'm sure that you'll agree that their collective experience and their vision and their point of view is gonna uh, lead to no, uh, it's going to be no shortage of interesting uh, dialogue that's happening. So, and that's the point. What we want to do is to spark a new discussion about reproducibility and to change the discourse so that give you real and actionable tools and ideas to take away from. But you can also play a part in changing reproducibility today. So with that, I'd like to ask uh, the panelists to introduce themselves. And Ihad, I'd like to ask uh, for you to start. Uh, thanks, Sami. Thanks for having me. I am Iyad. Um, I'm the CEO and co-founder of ResearchGate. ResearchGate is a social network for scientists, um, and it uh, created a place where scientists can be, uh, where can represent themselves with their work, their research, their skills, and it induced uh, quite a lot of transparency in the science world. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth, can you go next? Sure. I'm, I'm Elizabeth Irons. I'm the founder and CEO of Science Exchange, which is an online marketplace for outsourced research and development. And I've also been involved with the Reproducibility Project, Cancer Biology, as well as several other reproducibility initiatives like the Antibody Validation Project. Great. Thank you. And Mark? Hi. Thanks for having me. My name is Mark Raphael. I work at the Naval Research Lab. And my research involves quantifying the extracellular environment. The idea being we have a huge toolkit for visualizing what is happening in terms of signaling inside the cell, but oftentimes we don't know what the cell is measuring from its external environment. So that's of interest to NRL because it involves wound healing, and of course there's interest in cancer and development. And my connection to reproducibility is that DARPA had started a uh, biological control program, which also had this interest uh, where they were engineering cells to enhance their motion, increase wound speed, uh, healing speeds. And so there was this overlap in um, research interests. And what was interesting about the program, I'm sorry if I'm going a little long here, is that no, they had... <laughs> what was interesting about the program is that each of the grantees was paired with an IV and V team or a reproducibility team. So there was real-time reproducibility happening during the program itself with either research that was currently going on or just published. And so we reported on this in a comment article in Nature, and, and that, that's why I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thanks for being here. Uh, Mindy? Um, hi, everyone. I'm Mindy Goldsboro. Um, as Chief Scientific Officer of ATCC, I oversee the day-to-day -day product development work and also the organization's scientific strategy. I've worked for uh, organizations that have produced 
uh, research products for almost my entire career. So I have a great background in, is this robust? Is it reproducible? But nowhere has that been more important than at HECC. As Hamid says, we're an organization that delivers standards and controls to the scientific community. And ATCC is wholly committed to the idea of reproducibility, um, increasing that and sustaining that and uh, by any and all means. And I'm very pleased to be part of this uh, discussion today. Excellent. Thank you so much. So we have people here who have done reproducibility studies and organization, uh, several organizations that care tremendously about uh, reproducibility, organizations that were started on the basis of of reproducibility, and so I'm, I'm really excited about this, this hour and talking with you all. So I guess uh, let's start by asking the, the big question, which is why is reproducibility such a big issue in the biological sciences? Elizabeth, I'd love for you to start the discussion for us. Sure, yeah, I think um, reproducibility is such a big issue because it really is at the you know, center of scientific research. So it's really about the scientific method, this idea that you can reproduce the results that are generated. And I think recently there's been more openness about discussing how difficult that can be in the biological sciences and actually looking at the impact of those difficulties on really the usability and value of the results that are generated. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, Mindy, care to comment on that? Yeah, I see it uh, very much the same way as, as Elizabeth. Um, to see science move forward uh, is really the hope and dream of every scientist. And uh, to do that, uh, we need reproducibility. And it's particularly important when we're doing work that has uh, a medical outcome. Uh, but we can't, if we can't build on each other's work, which is the foundation of science, uh, we're not going to be able to move forward. Uh, and to be able to reproduce the work, we need excellence in study design. Uh, we need transparency. There's so many elements, and I think we're going to be talking about many of them today. Um, in every field, in every career, if you don't start with the right ingredients, if you don't start with a good plot for your book, it, it's the same in science, you know, it's that you have to get back to the foundations in order to make great discoveries. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, Mark, you were nodding your head just now as, as uh, both Elizabeth and Mindy were talking and you've just come out of living this, uh, you know, by, by doing this reproducibility. Care to comment on why it's this big issue in biology? And I, I, I'd like to also mention you you come from a physics background. And so, um, you know, maybe maybe talking about, you know, is, is there any difference between or, or how we can see this? Is it a biological sciences uh, issue and, and how reproducibility can can uh, can play there? Uh, yeah, I guess to start with the physics background, it was it was fascinating transitioning into biology because, frankly, the systems we work with in biology are just much more complex than what I was working with mm -hmm. in physics. I was I was I was working on uh, hard drive technology. It wasn't a simple thing, uh, but it wasn't alive. <laughs> and uh, and so I remember when I first got into the lab and you know there were discussions about the cells look happy or or there were discussions about how in our hands the experiments work this way and it was just a whole new language to me and I just became fascinated with how one sort of works their way through this. Um, just to, uh, to add on to what to, uh, Mindy and Elizabeth said, I, I would just also say, you know, you have a scientist, you, you want your work to have impact, you don't want to see it die on the vine just because someone couldn't reproduce it for some silly reason. And also the funders, right? If you're a program manager, if you're a funding agency, if you're a company, you want to see, you want to get the most bang for your buck, <laughs> whether it's taxpayer dollar or your own dollar. And so I think that it's just critical. Yeah, thanks. And so, Ehad, you started uh, ResearchGate. Um, you instigated the world's largest scientific conversation that's still happening. Um, why, from your perspective, why is reproducibility such a big, big issue? Because I know it's also near and dear to your heart. Yeah, so um, my doctorate thesis was in virology, so I worked with viruses. Um, and 
I was, my dream was always to win the Nobel Prize. I always wanted to do something big in this world and something great. And I think this is, lies in every heart of every scientist to do something good for the world. And this reproducibility topic, honestly, was never in my mind in the early years of when I was doing research because it was obvious to me that I want to do something which, which others should be able to reproduce. Um, so I think um, it really took years for me also to become aware of that problem um, just because I had my own experiences in reproducing research from other people. So this topic is, in my opinion, one of the most important topics in science. Um, and uh, luckily, um, ResearchGate enabled um, all scientists in the world to represent themselves in real time, solving part of this reproducibility topic, hopefully in the future, with all the other uh, players in that space. Um, but again, I think, why is it so important? Um, it is part of our identity as a scientist. We want to do things which makes a difference in the world. And if these things we think making a difference are not making a difference, that's a bad thing. And um, this mm -hmm. is where I think we all have to work to, together to make that um, make it uh, better in the future. So what I heard from all of you is this combination of, and, and I think you all touched on this, this, this idea that um, study design and, and lab practices is one area. Uh, I heard um, transparency in another area. And Ihad, what you're mentioning is essentially just personal incentives or incentives within, uh, within, within the community. So let's actually dive deeper into each of these uh, with a little bit more um, fidelity, as it were, and just see if we can have a discussion. I'd love to just start with that first one. You talked about the plot in the book. Uh, and really having a good good plan and a good plot for the book, uh, Mindy. So, uh, what can what can scientists do to improve their study design and sort of lab hygiene or lab practices moving forward? Yeah, I mean, so um, I think you know, open communication, whether that's within your own laboratory um, and also with the scientific community, is is part of it, um, more detailed protocols are a good place to start. Uh, many times it's the little details uh, that, that really make all the difference. And people sometimes think of those little details as their job security. Oh, I can't tell anybody how to really do this because then I'll become obsolete. Don't think of that as job security. Um, think of it as enhancing the scientific community and uh, think of it as a, a career enhancement. If your work is easily reproducible, that's going to mean more for your career than keeping something, you know, some, some detail in that protocol a secret so only your lab can do it. Um, and I also can't say enough um, about the quality of the materials you're using. This may sound a little self-serving from HECC, but it really isn't. It's really for the scientific community. Um, are those materials that you're using authenticated? Um, you know, that's, that's really a key to, to starting out at, that, at the right point in your, um, in your career in terms of, of using the right materials. Um, it's really one of the basic building blocks of the reproducibility. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, Mark, you just reproduced some, some work. Uh, care to comment on, on study design and what your experience was based on what was reported, how the studies were uh, designed, and just you know, how, what your experience was there? Uh, yeah, so the, the way this IVMD program is designed, the sort of real-time reproducibility is, um, I guess you, you can, if you imagine two scenarios, and one is, I'll say scenario A is one we're quite familiar with. You're, you're part of a research group, you conduct experiments, you have some interesting results, you go through peer review, you publish, and then maybe two or three years down the line, uh, someone reads about, someone reads your paper and says, this is, could be foundational, I'd like to use this, and they try and reproduce it and they run into problems, it happens a lot. So then they go back to your group, which may not, may look very different, right? Postdocs, graduate students may have moved on, the samples may not, may no longer be viable in the freezer, and this is a lot of times what happens, and this is where the reproducibility uh, project just sort of stops because people only have so much time to dedicate to this. They have to get on to their, get on with their original programs. So that's, that's kind of scenario A. So what we're trying to implement with the IVB program we'll call scenario B. 
And so now you're doing your research program, but there's also a shadow team or just you're teamed with an IBMB program that's reproducing in real time. So now you submit to a journal and in your letter to the editor, you not only say, believe me, this is amazing, but you also say, oh, and it's been reproduced. We have an IBMB team right here, right? And then the same thing happens with the, uh, the reviewers who don't believe what you're doing and say, yeah, 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 right, right? So then, you, you know, you come back to them and say, listen, I've got this reproducibility study on this part of the program already, and I'm happy to put it in the supporting information, and it helps there as well. So all, right from the beginning, it's helping your career. And then two to three years later, when you get to that scenario where someone's trying to reproduce it, if you go back, if someone comes back to the lab and the lab's very different and they can't, well, there's this IBMB program that happened alongside, which they can go to as well to help with reproducibility. And maybe as part of that IBMB program, everything was videotaped. The whole process, the whole protocol was videotaped. And so maybe you just send them the videotape and let them work from that. Mm -hmm. Think this, this, mm -hmm. this is the idea. Yeah. So it sounds like uh, designing the study with reproducibility in mind and putting all those controls in, into place right up front and then having this independent team, right? And, and just so for our viewers who, who may not know, what does IVNV stand for? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so it's independent yeah. verification and validation. And I just, I should point out, this is very common in other fields of engineering, software, mechanical, electrical. It's just, I, if I was going to uh, hazard a guess, I would say it hasn't really made its way into biology, at least uh, publicly funded biology, because of inertia, because of, uh, you know, it's always gone through peer review before you get the mm -hmm. rest to the replication, to the reproducibility studies. That would be my guess. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it's quite common in other fields of engineering. It, it's actually considered best practice. So all, all we were doing is just saying, well, let's, you know, more and more when you ask people, are they doing applied biology? The answer is yes, I'm doing bioengineering. And if you're, if you're doing an engineering study, if you're doing something that's gonna go into the human body, I think the earlier, at least in the field of engineering, the, the idea is the earlier you, you introduce reproducibility, introduce verification, validation, the better off you are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. So Elizabeth, you have a long and, and deep history with reproducibility, both in your own research and then at Science Exchange with um, the antibody validation uh, initiative that you took on. Um, and, and then also just by brokering science that's happening between different groups. What's your take on study design and how that can be, you know, where re reproducibility can come in, how early can it come in, how early should it come in and how? Yeah, I think um, one of the things that made me really excited about participating in this webinar was that Mark was taking place in it. So I had reached out to Mark about his work because for me, you know, I've talked about reproducibility for years and, um, you know, as part of the reproducibility project, which tried to do exactly what Mark talked about, which was take published studies and actually try to independently replicate those results. And it was obviously very, very challenging. Um, for lots of reasons, but I think there are some really basic pieces around study design that can make a really big difference. So a lot of it's just about documentation. Some of the challenges that we had um, with the reproducibility project was really just knowing, you know, what reagents did people really use. Um, so actually having these standard repositories like ATCC, JAX, um, at at Gene, like these sort of places was was really like when when those reagents were deposited were deposited in these repositories that was um, we were always like that's a huge win because we can easily access them move them into another facility versus trying to go to a university and obtain something that maybe in somebody's freezer or may not be hasn't been you know properly QC'd um, and you know usually. You know, a lot of the time there's like a lot of legal delays around MTAs, et cetera, that take place with those universities. So, you know, I think actually having like full documentation of the unique reagents, the full protocols, so putting protocols on these repositories that exist now, like protocols um, IO and these other you know, sources of full protocols. And then also data. It was um, very sort of worrying actually how much data loss there is from published studies in the sense that 
people just publish, you know, a roll up of results, so an actual graph rather than um, link that out to a full data set. And then when you go back to the lab and you ask for the original data set so that you can do, um, you know, basically a power study to power your, your replication, there's often um, missing data or data points that were excluded without any pre exclusion criteria that actually change the um, statistical significance of the original result. So there was things like that that happened that we were just, um, you know, really challenged with in taking a published result and reproducing it. And I think the approach that, you know, DARPA took by funding Mark's work, where you really have this team that's working alongside the team before they get to the publication, I think that's um, just much more practical and, you know, a really, really nice approach. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, this, this actually ties in. So what we're talking about here is, uh, you know, a study design with more QC, the independent, uh, you know, independent validation, but also there's a lot of conversation here around, uh, around the communications and how it happens. And it sounds to me like what all of you are saying so far is that there's, uh, that there needs to be additional or more communication and, and, and you know, in, into play. And Ihad, so, ResearchGate communications are happening abound. What are you, what are some of the things that you see and your team sees as far as the communications that are happening? I mean, what kinds of information are uh, being shared with you know between scientists here, and how how might we be able to learn collectively about about that about reproducibility? Yeah. So um, what I find interesting, just uh, to start high level, when we started ResearchGate in the first five years of ResearchGate's existence. There were in total two million data sets slash publications slash slash code conference papers etc shared from the whole user base into the community and now every three three weeks two and a half million are being shared so the amount of total uh, research which is being uploaded of any kind has grown exponentially over the last decade um, and interestingly if you look at the different types um, there's almost no you know, people are, it's funny, in the beginning it was around a lot of metadata. Then they started to add to the metadata the full text if they were allowed to do that. Um, and then the, as the next step, they added data around the publication. So these things started to grow naturally because the, the scientists start to feel comfortable to represent themselves in a social network environment, which again, beforehand, the other options or the other platforms which existed didn't give you the let's say the researchers view as a product. So they never felt comfortable to share um, um, research related stuff. What we also found very interesting over the last um, you know, 10 years working on ResearchGate is the number of questions which are being answered and how fast they're being answered. So um, every question gets um, an answer within, um, within, I think it's, sorry, maybe 48 hours, every question. So it means at the end, the engagement around questions and ResearchGate is way higher than a lot of people have anticipated in the very early days of ResearchGate, where they said, why should I as a scientist help another scientist who I don't know uh, with a problem, uh, which I might be scooped or I might be you know, um, do, doing something wrong there. Um, I don't want to, you know, maybe if I do something wrong, potentially my my name will be damaged or my reputation will be damaged. All these fears uh, seem to be uh, disappearing um, and mm -hmm. just makes the scientists more comfortable, more and more in an online environment to share uh, more early stage research. And the most interesting in most recent times, if you look at the COVID, uh, current COVID crisis where um, we created a, a COVID-19 community on ResearchGate. So we built just for the COVID-19 researchers which we also will be expanded to more research areas in the future, but we just fast forwarded that development within nine days. Uh, we built up a product which aggregates all the content and all the activities around this one topic into a community with moderators. Um, and if you look at the number of preprints being uploaded, it's absolutely incredible. Like the number of preprints has is skyrocketing in, in the COVID-19 research area. And interestingly, the format of the research articles are also changing. So the articles become shorter um, and not anymore. Um, so you, you don't write anymore so much introduction, you're adding more figures. You just want to get the content out, right? Like the, 
the article in itself was designed in a world where there was the access to information quite limited. And now access to information is not limited, but we still write the same introduction as we have written in the previous papers we, um, we designed. So it's always the same, your rehash of information, information. So a lot of things happening, which I think will be advantages for reproducibility in the future, uh, which is not only the fact that we have a profile and share our research, but also we start to play around with the formats um, of research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, this is interesting as far as the, the discussions that are happening within, you know, within ResearchGate. And Mark, um, let me ask you a question. So with, with the work that you were doing, um, uh, you mentioned something about like the postdoc has left, and that's the postdoc that, that the postdoc that needs to have have done the work or, or had done the work. That um, this may be a qualitative question to answer, but would you have been able to reproduce the study had you not communicated with the team that had done the work? Uh, would you have been, been as successful, or what would have been the um, the issues? Had had you not had the ability to communicate with the cadence that Ehad is talking about on ResearchGate? Yeah, I I think Elizabeth would be able to speak better about sort of the um, what would have the would what would have been if we were going back, you know, two years later. I can tell you, we felt it, it was just absolutely critical to have a contact in the laboratory that you were paired with, the grantees laboratory, and we visited multiple times, and we would get trained in proper techniques for washing cells and, and handling cells in general, which may be sensitive uh, to various, uh, you know, um, just temperature ranges that you typically don't even publish, that you might just say, I culture them at this temperature, but it's actually, the cells are unhealthy at 0.5 C higher. <laughs> and so you, and you learn these sorts of things when you go and you actually interact directly. And so I can't say that could not have happened, but I, I think Elizabeth could speak better to, to, to whether that's accurate about, you know, how, how much easier that made things. Yeah. Yeah. I think it certainly would make things easier um, having that original contact, but, it also kind of worries me somewhat that that's that, that that's really the dependency um, to be able to reproduce results is requires you to go to somebody else's lab. Um, yeah. I do think that that actually is in contrast to what people's general expectations are, right? So like people sort of have this expectation that you know, a published piece of work in their mind, you know, it should be reproducible. Um, Although a lot of scientists would say a lot of the time it's not, but I th I definitely think the the sort of published research article as a sort of artifact of research is really you know very poor representation of what was actually done over usually many years of work, um, including you know a lot of the time a lot of the data sets that are generated not just that underlie the figures that are then not included, but actually you know, huge amounts of data that is generated but never even written up for publication. And all of that kind of informs, you know, a better picture of what's really happening versus what is kind of written up in a publication unit. And so I think Ead's point around, you know, can we start to publish smaller units of work? And if you look back in the 70s and, and earlier on, really the units of work were quite small um, that were published. And I think you start to see, you know, if we don't have this giant story of 50 pieces of, <laughs> of experimental data that all have to fit together in this you know, nice story, then we're much more likely to, one, be able to document things properly, two, not have to kind of leave out things that are inconvenient, that don't really match all the rest of the story. Those things, I think, you know, do underlie a lot of the challenges with, then being able to reproduce the published work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I would say the real challenge came in, I think in molecular biology, things have gotten much more reproducible, especially when robotics is involved, you yeah. know, and that mm -hmm. is, right? And cell biology, I my feeling is we're still figuring this out because, you know, you still have the human element involved. There's still a lot of human in the loop. And that's, 
that always turned out to be the point where we needed to go visit uh, the grantee lab and, and work with them. It was always with working with the cells. Yeah, I think also animal studies. So I definitely think automation to me is, you know, really going to underlie the future of how we generate data. So if you think about where there's challenges, it's really artisanal sort of protocols rather than, you know, properly validated assays that are generally run using instruments that stream data sets into, you know, actual software that that is then analyzed. Those steps usually are reproducible. It is really the pieces where it's kind of a, a person sort of cooking a cake rather than <laughs> rather than necessarily, you know, sort of rigorous um, you know, standards that are used to run a particular assay. Um, and I think in animal work, as well as in cell-based work, there's also a lot of variability and a lot of challenges with reproducibility for that same reason. So a lot of these new advances around whole cage monitoring systems that actually take humans out of that process, I think are incredibly important because the data sets that are generated by those systems will likely be, you know, a lot more robust. Also, the design of, it, of the experiment itself, um, a lot of people don't use the statistics at their fingertips, uh, you know, to be able to design uh, the number of samples, the number of replicates. And the right number of replicates is not the number of tubes that fit in your rack or the number of wells that you have in a plate. You know, th there is, there is a, a whole science behind figuring that out. and and. That's one of the things that that I personally see lacking the most. You know, everybody says, "Oh, well, I'll do an N of three, or I'll do the experiment twice, and if it happens to work, that's great. I move on." But that's not the answer. Oh, I love that example because I have um, a story that I tell around when we first started to do the reproducibility project, and we would present you know, the, about the project to different organizations. And one of the things I would ask people is, if you did an experiment five times and it worked three times, you know, what do you kind of do with that? And, you know, most people are like, well, you know, you write up the three times. And, and I would always say, but how do you know that it was the three times that it worked versus the other two, particularly if you don't have positive and negative controls? And again, I think the independent you know, validation of those initial exploratory studies. I think people kind of miss the point that a lot of research, you can categorize either as exploratory or confirmatory. And confirmatory studies by definition can be powered to determine the certainty of the exploratory study. Versus an exploratory study is really, you know, kind of just seeing like, can I get a result here? And so I think like to your point, trying to use, um, you know, separation of exploratory and confirmatory studies, use power um, and experimental design, particularly in the confirmatory studies, is, um, you know, I think really, really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those, those are very good points. I, I, I think, you know, when people start talking about uh, work, the, the experiment worked and didn't work, I think we're 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 getting into the p-value world, which is a minefield I am not going to step into here. But it was something I never saw in physics, by the way. The p-value was something new to me. But but the idea of replicates, I, you do see that quite a bit because you know there's technical replicates with the 96 well plate, right? And you do the same cells, the same reagents, everything's repeated. Maybe you vary one one concentration, and your error bars tend to be pretty small, right? But then there's biological replicates where maybe you get a new aliquot out of the freezer and maybe you know your your reagents are new and things like that and then your error bars start to grow right and I, I guess what I want to point out is that the reproducibility study is really the extreme case of the biological replicate it's new people new you know new cells new reagents and all this stuff and so the importance of the biological replicate becomes clear then because you can just see the more of those you do the better chance your work has of being reproducible mm -hmm. yeah and, and mark to that point I think that's really interesting because when we ran you know, replication studies with types of experiments, so assays that were highly variable. So some examples would be like IVIS imaging of tumor cells, you know, by definition, hugely variable um, assay with lots of, of noise um, in that system. We would always publish the full data set because we had pre-registered the protocol, 
we had you know an open data repository so we would publish all of that data and people would literally comment the labs doing that work must just be terrible because look at the error bars on that and these were like labs that were professional labs that had run <laughs> thousands of these studies versus a postdoc or student that had probably done that experiment you know for the first time and published it but they were publishing technical replicates or or data sets that were actually excluding the variability and that was so frustrating to me because i actually think one of the things that came out of the reproducibility project was a real look at what data actually looks like in cancer biology yeah. and i think it shows yeah. that what is published does not reflect the full data sets that are generated the assays are much more variable than what people generally publish. Mm -hmm. yeah, are agree. people sharing more of this information on on places like ResearchGate? I mean, are are there you know null negative data or negative findings that are being uh, shared even though they're not published? Uh, can you can you speak to that, Ihad? Yeah, um, yeah, that happens, and it happens even more than it happened in the beginning. Um, because of one thing, I, um, there was no incentive in the early years um, to publish those failed experiments. What would be the incentive as a scientist to, to publish it? First of all, it's tough to get it in a journal. Uh, number two, it takes time because your BI tells you to continue to your research because they have a goal in mind. Um, so, um, and then you want to have these failed experiments tied to your name, right? You want at the end you have to give some sort of a recognition to um, the people um, who created those data sets or created these um, research experiments. So we have seen an, an increase in sharing those um, files and, and data sets and small written, like small written pieces of research um, because people feel just more comfortable to do that in a profile like ResearchGate um, for one reason. Um, they can at the end say if it's being cited or it's being used, it's connected to their profile, to their name. And I think this is one of the, the big topics, uh, in my opinion, is recognition um, in your micro community. This is what we are all striving for, right? Like, I, I don't want recognition from a random guy or random person in the world. Like, yes, good if someone says, hey, good job. But at the end, what you want uh, deep in your heart is the recognition of the people you're working with every time. And, in your lab, um, people in the same area, and this is what we're striving for as a scientist, which was still a big impact in the world. But it, it's like it's, it's the micro communities, which were quite intransparent um, in the past, and uh, creating networks of people and making those things more transparent creates these moments of recognition for scientists, which they didn't have before. And the only way to get those recognitions were go, going to a conference, uh, presenting there, or being in front of a poster where like two people are passing because they are by coincidence in this conference as well. But the other ones, all the data around conferences is just disappearing after the conference is done. So all this together um, just creates a different dynamic now um, around uh, recognition and you know people care about more work. And one thing which I find also very, very interesting in, in ResearchGate is that the uh, traffic you're getting um, is not only is increasing, not only because scientists are accessing our content it's also because non-scientists accessing the content so we have uh, close to a hundred million visits per month so you can see like over over a billion uh, page views per month so that um there's so much happening which is from non-scientists from people who are interested in science and i think one of the innovation problems or challenges we have in this world is that we are limiting not, in, for example, in computer science, but in many biological science, we're limiting the innovation in a very particular group of, of people. And um, you have to be in a lab, you have to be in academia. It's very tough to do experiments if you're not in the lab. So I think this is also a major challenge. Um, and also we could overcome that if we would try, uh, if we could bring more innovation brought, like into the broader community in biological science and then also the reproducibility problems also could potentially be addressed by a larger group of people who can access machines or can access devices, even if they're not in an academic institution. Look at computer science. I think computer science is always the best, best example. Um, the greatest stuff comes not all, it's not coming anymore from, from academia, if you're really honest. It comes from the big corporations or uh, young people sitting at home and trying to think stuff out. Um, so I think we, in biology science, we're still lacking this easy to easy access to equipment, devices, um, and then doing your stuff um, yourself. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So we're talking a lot about incentives right now. You're just mentioning this idea of, um, of of being recognized by your peers and and being able to do this. And and the question that comes to my mind, a, a lot of times publications is used as the currency for academia, right? And that essentially that's that's how a- academics really measure their currency and how that that's how they're measured within their 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 career. But I'm wondering because especially Elizabeth, you work not just with academics. I mean, you work with a lot of institutions that do science as well. And so to add your point about, you know, computer science and big corporations doing the innovation, what are you seeing? I mean, is this an academic and and sort of publication related issue or is it a scientific issue? I mean, how is that being handled within, within um, pharma, biotech, other, other kinds of industries who regularly and routinely use science and innovate around it? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question because uh, we mostly actually work with pharmaceutical and biotech companies, not, not academics. Um, although I think, yeah, with us, so basically, I think that there's um, a lot of the those companies actually rely on published work as a source for you know, innovation that they would then build on. So, for example, identifying novel targets that then may be used in, in a drug discovery and development program. But I do think pharma and biotech have really now got to a point where the lack of reproducibility of published results, you know, that's really just a basic assumption to them that a lot of things that are published don't reproduce. And so therefore, you know, they've actually started to initiate very early target ID type projects that in the past might have been done by academics. So for example, if you look at some of the big data sets around you know, cell line based um, screening, both whole genome CRISPR and SHRNA screening, you know, a lot of those now um, are actually being generated by companies like NIBR, um, you know, whereas in the past they might have been generated by academic institutions. So uh, I think for, for pharma companies, I, um, Another story I would also ask when I spoke to them about the reproducibility project, because they were very interested in the results of that project, was um, you know, how, how often do you have problems you know, reproducing published results? A lot of the time was the answer. But then I asked them, you know, how often do you have problems you know, moving results like assays from your own facilities to contract research organizations, which they do all the time, by the way. And then they were like, actually, like, not very often. So they actually don't very often have problems moving assays from within their institutions to contract research organizations. And I think the difference there is that their assays are very standardized and have been validated. They have positive and negative controls. They understand the variability of the assay. They've documented fully the protocols. And so really the transfer of that is much more straightforward than, you know, in academia where a lot of the time it really is just you kind of make do with the cell line that was already in the lab or this animal model that you borrowed from <laughs> from another lab versus you know actually checking and validating the assay before you use it um, so mm-hmm. i definitely think there is you know a pretty significant difference in reproducibility between academia and industry i think the other point is around incentives so for biotech and pharma companies they're strongly incentivized to try to get a drug that works. So ultimately, if the science, you know, isn't robust enough to really create a drug around it, then they probably want to try to find that out as quickly as possible rather than wasting money and progressing forward versus in academia, it's really about getting to a publication. And um, frankly, like once you've published something, there is very little chance that somebody does try and reproduce it and then sort of actually expose the fact that it's not reproducible. Mm-hmm. Mindy, you also work with a lot of um, industry with, at, at, at ATCC. What, what, what do they reach out to you for, and how does ATCC support that? I mean, what is your, what's been your um, view on that? Well, a lot of times it's, it's controlled. You know, as, as Elizabeth said, the, the incentives and the and the um, the interests are very different between the academic and the industrial customer. There's a lot of money riding on uh, on that transfer of that assay to the to the CRO. Um, 
that is somebody's job to do that and to do that well. Whereas, you know, in academia, there there isn't that responsibility, there isn't that um, that incentive to make sure that somebody else can can reproduce your results. You know, certainly industry comes to us for controls. They come to us for the standards that they that they use in their assays, and but. It's really the, the the quality behind those, the fact that everything is authenticated, the fact the fact that everything has a pedigree, um, you know, so that so that are the the types of of reasons why uh, HCCC is is trusted as as the source for these kinds of materials. But you know, to make to make a difference here, we really have to have to have to um, you know break down those those incentives so that the re the academic researchers are incentivized you know whether it's the training everyone whether you're in industry or academia you have mentors you have people who influence you it, it has to be the responsibility of all of the generations to make reproducibility a you know a priority well, I, I would just touch on that because we hadn't touched on this yet, and I think it's at the actually like the heart of the challenge about trying to improve reproducibility, which is that it, at the end of the day, it's actually the funders. So the funders are, you know, really responsible for determining appropriate allocation and use of, use of the funding, and I think have largely ignored their responsibility around looking for ways to both measure and reward reproducibility. So the fact that Mark's study funded by DARPA is the first example of that I'm aware of of a team that's funded to basically try to, you know, verify and validate work alongside the original funding funded work is kind of crazy. And it's actually very interesting because Mark pointed out to me, he said basically people look at it as almost a waste of money, but it's just one less program that got funded and yet it makes the work that was already validated so much more reusable, so much more reliable, and it actually does give you that foundation that you're likely to be able to build upon. Mark, do you care to comment on that at all? Or, I mean, just really talking about, not necessarily talking about, um, you know, the well, talking about the work and, and its value and, and going from there. Yeah, Elizabeth said it very well. You know, you and we touched on it before. Is, you know, I think program managers, funding agencies, they want the most for their dollars, just like companies do. But there is, uh, I guess, the current the current uh, structure of funding doesn't really incorporate a sort of reproducibility or IV and B study. And and so you'd say, oh my gosh, it looks expensive. But, uh, you know, 8 to 10 percent maybe of the program. So maybe, yes, you fund one less program, but you get this, the value the, of what you get from the finished product. If that moves on to be a building block in future experiments where before it would have just kind of died on the vine, I mean, I don't know how you put a price on that. It's, it's really invaluable. And I think that's also important funders around you know, things like ATCC, JAX, like these repositories, um, you know, one thing I worry about is a lot of the time people overlook, you know, that value because they think that they should just be finding these novel research studies, which, um, which of course, we all want to see breakthroughs happen. But if you don't then actually have places where you can then put QC reagents and um, and data that was generated from those experiments, you know, you really do lose a lot of the value of funding it to begin with. And I think some of the best and most innovative funders, particularly foundations, have started to recognize this. Um, like Michael J. Fox Foundation, you know, they really require the, the um, depositing of all of the, the reagents and resources that are generated from their funded results. And I think this is, this is an area um, that Mindy can probably comment on further, but to me, like I said, when we tried to do these replications, if one of those reagents was already in a repository, it was night and day in terms of our ability to move quickly, to be able to access that and feel confident that you know, the reagent was actually going to work. Um, and so it really made the work much more reusable. Mm -hmm. 
Um, this is a, g a good point to maybe ask Mindy if you can comment on that as well. And then I want to move to um, a question from one of the audience members, actually. Yeah, I mean, we have certainly anecdotally found that to be true as well as, you know, we've recently put out a survey to several hundred researchers and we hear the same thing. People are much more likely to be able to reproduce their results if they start with qualified material. Um, it, it really is one of the, the most important things that you can do. I mean, you don't get age-old sayings like garbage in, garbage out if it's not true. You know, so th yeah. that really, you know, summarizes everything. If you're not starting, if just because the label that you pull out of the freezer from the guy down the hall says that it's X doesn't not mean that it's X. Mm -hmm. Well, that's actually a good good segue because the question that I was going to actually ask is um, about passage. So uh, one one somebody's asking, uh, what are some ways that we can work with micro microbial culture for reproducible data, especially when there's uh, the the passage of that culture? So you know, I mean, to your point about not just not even knowing whether the label is what it is, what is this history? What is this provenance? And uh, of it. So, care to comment on that? How do you? How would you advise the scientific community to think about that? Well, um, they need to understand how important that is for their particular experiment. You know, for quality control experiments, you're only allowed to to you know by USP, uh, you're only uh, you know supposed to let things go five passages from from you know P zero. Um, you know, so it, it, in some regulated spaces, there are very clear guidelines. You know, in an academic lab, uh, that's one of those little details that get that gets left out. Maybe the experiment only works if you're, you know, within within three passages from from p zero. Maybe it works, you know, matter what the passage is. That's the kind of of information that we're talking about with those detailed protocols that allows you to say it'll work in this space but it won't work in that space um you know that's that's the kind of thing that can save somebody months of work yeah yeah so here's one more to, question uh, yeah please go ahead go ahead i, I was just going to say in the ib and d program so we uh, as part of that we had one of these microscopes that fits in your incubator it's an incubite and so what you're doing is you're measuring the growth uh, curves in real time. And so as you can, so you're, you're keeping track of the passage and the growth curve. And so you can passage these at say 50% confluency at passage four and have confidence that you are at the same spot in the growth curve where the researcher or the person you're trying to reproduce uh, their work was. And I, I found it very helpful. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, let's go to another question, actually, from um, from an audience member, and this is uh, Ihad. I'd like for you to address this first. Um, some journals have started to report negative results um, in special issues uh, or or data variation results in special issues. Are, you know, along with these, uh, are there additional ways that we can use and share negative results? Um, yes, I think at the end you can use it. You know. First of all, I think um, sharing results, but also really documenting them properly is key. Um, and uh, where do you share them at the end? It really depends on the audience you want to reach, right? So it's um, at the end, you have to figure out for yourself, um, do you want to reach your lab, your department, uh, more than that? And then this also will inform the decision where do you upload the, the, the content piece? Um, so ultimately, we also have seen in the beginning um, in ResearchGate, we always can learn by the users what they do with the, with the features we're giving them. When we had like a very broad feature where, where it said just upload negative results or failed experiments, that didn't really work. Um, so you need to really specify what people should upload or should share um, because we are shaping not only research care, but even like the journals as well. We are shaping a very particular behavior from the scientists. And if we don't um, understand what we're doing with uh, what with the questions we're asking the user to do, then we also don't understand. We won't get it. We won't find out. Or we won't know what they're going to do. So we have seen that you have to be very specific 
and asking the user what to do. And I think ultimately, um, I have seen this or generally like also now in the COVID crisis, um, sh even sharing very early um, to the whole world can be very damaging. Um, so there has to be sort of, and still I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of work to do. Um, I think full openness to the whole world um, it might be not um, the best, um, except you are uh, marking the content as as that. Um, and the same with failed experiments. Um, so again, I think most important, share uh, what you feel comfortable to share, um, document it properly, um, and then choose the medium where you want to share it. And um, mm -hmm. again, on ResearchGate is, I would say by far right now, the, the platform where you can get it in real time to the people who follow you or who follow the research area. Uh, but then you have to be sure that you, as again, document it properly because then it won't help um, the people if they just have a raw file there with something in it. Thank you. So let's take, let's each of us take a minute maybe and synthesize as we're coming to the bottom of the hour here and synthesize. And I'd love to ask each of you if there's one thing that our viewers can take away from this conversation that they can do today, um, what would that be? Mark, let's start with you. What's, what's the one thing that, uh, as a viewer, they can, they can take away and, and, and do today and be actionable? Uh, well, we mentioned biological replicates already, but I would, I would go back to Mindy's earlier point about, um, you know, expand your, expand your view of what a control is, right? If, if, if you check that your pipette, your micro pipette is calibrated properly, that's an instrumental control. And if you check the pH and osmolarity of your solution, that is a reagent control, right? And so a lot of times we think of controls as the more complicated wild type, you know, experiment that positive, negative, that has to be done to get the paper published. But all of these controls, uh, the, these little controls that don't take that long build enormous confidence, and then a lot of times they flush out the problem in the protocol. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you, Elizabeth. What about you? What what advice do you have for the community? Um, I think if I had to pick one thing of what people can do themselves to probably improve reproducibility, it would be around documentation. So I definitely think that. Um, you know, even as an individual scientist, as you move on, if you actually had everything documented in an electronic lab notebook, you had all of your protocols fully documented in protocols.io, you had actually put, you know, the resources and reagents that you generated into repositories. Like, it would actually make your life a lot easier as well going forward, but it would improve the reproducibility of your work and reusability of your work substantially. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Awesome. Jihad? Um, again, very high level, very simple. Um, is for the topic reproducibility. I think most of the scientists are still not aware of the topic. And I strongly believe in the moment where we start to be aware of people will do or will try to reproduce what I'm doing right now, it will change their behaviors. It will change the way they think about the experiment. Um, and then there also will be more um, or will be easier to reach uh, also with new ideas, which all all we are, all we are working on that having uh, in order to make uh, the reproducibility issue go away. Mm -hmm. uh, one more thing I want to say, Mindy, I love ATCC. Uh, I when I did my PhD thesis, I was working with viruses, and we ordered them from ATCC. Amazing service. Um, feedback was always great. I you know when I go back to my PhD, there was this was the company. I was working with, and I loved working with, with you people there. Thank you. Just as a side note. There you go. Thanks. Thank you. Mindy, what about Thank you? you? Last words. <laughs> um, so last words. Um, so I think uh, the scientific community is in a unique position right now. For many of us, our work is in the freezer, and we're all anxious to get it back out. I would hope that after this, this discussion, um, everyone listening would take a pledge to, before they take their materials out of those freezers, think about how they can improve the reproducibility of the work and the experiments that they're about to do. Well, um, as, as we're 
you're wrapping up this conversation in the hour. I want to thank all of you for joining this uh, discussion. I want to thank ATCC for supporting uh, this discussion as well. Uh, I wish you all the best of luck. And to our viewers, I wish you all the best of luck in getting through this time. And as Mindy said, getting back to work and, um, and imp uh, imp improving and repairing your reproducibility. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye.